you know why there are four Gospels in the Bible? There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they kind of all tell the same story of Jesus. So why wasn't there just one? Each of them was written with a unique perspective for a specific audience. Matthew was Jewish, and he was writing to a primarily Hebrew audience. He quoted the Old Testament more than any of the other gospel writers. In order to prove that Jesus was it, the Messiah, the chosen one, the promised king that they had all been waiting for. You have Mark, who was written to a Gentile audience of mainly Roman leaders. It was people that didn't know Jewish customs at all. He was framing Jesus as a servant of God here on a mission. Mark's gospel is very action-focused, showing what Jesus did from one location to the next. Luke also wrote his gospel to a mainly Greek Gentile audience, specifically to be used in court as an appeal for Paul. Luke was a doctor, so he focused on Jesus' humanity as the perfect human. This was a very Greek approach to life because they are all on a journey to become the perfect human. Luke is also the only Gentile author of the entire New Testament. Lastly, the Gospel of John was written by the Apostle John to a fairly mixed audience, but more so Jewish than anything. His focus was on Jesus being God, coming down to earth, and ultimately as the Savior of the world. Seeing all four Gospels this way gives us a well-rounded view of who Jesus was and is. Let me know in the comments which of the Gospels you have enjoyed studying the most. Okay, I'm really confused. If I ask Jesus for forgiveness, he'll give it to me, so why can't I just go out and sin all I want and then just ask for forgiveness? I mean, I still should be good, right? That's a good question, and actually the Apostle Paul answers it in Romans 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may more abound? By no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Okay, but what does that mean exactly? It means that we were once slaves to sin and had no ability to choose what was right, but because of God's transforming work within us, we are now alive to him and dead to sin. Those who have been truly transformed by God no longer desire to live in the muck and the mire of their old life. Like why would we want to continue in the sins that Christ died for? While other religions are based on the idea of obeying God to avoid threat or punishment, we obey God out of love for him because he first loved us. give you $20 if you could tell me one Bible verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Jeremiah 29, 11. Great, here you go. It was $20. God bless you. you. Are you a Christian? Yes. Great. It's wonderful to praise the Lord. If you had one message to the world, what would it be? Um, trust Jesus. I'll change your life. Amen. God bless you. Amen. What's up guys? I hope you're having an awesome day and today I want to give you some unusual tips in regards to hearing the voice of God. And I say unusual because it might not have been something that you would have particularly have heard before. So without further ado, let's get it. The first thing I want to tell you is that when God is speaking to you, he's going to speak to you on your level or he's going to speak to you in a way that you're going to understand. I'll tell you this, God is very proper and he can be very eloquent. But for the sake of communicating with you, he will dumb things down, he will make them simple, he'll put them in layman's terms, and so many different things. And so God being very humble, because humility sources itself from God, right? God being very humble, he's going to speak to you in the way that's best for you to understand. And so that means that he has to speak in KJV for you to understand him, then fine. If that means he has to speak in modern English for you to understand him and know that he is God, then that's fine. If that means that if you speak more than one language, he has to speak in like one of the foreign languages that you know in order for you to understand him and know that he's God, then he's going to do it. Let's say that I speak English and French. If my native language is French, but I speak English often because I live in America, he may just speak to me in French because that's my native language and that's the thing that I would actually prefer for him to speak me speak to me in. So for your sake, so that you know that he's speaking to you, so that you understand that he's speaking to you, you be like, oh yeah, that's God speaking to me for real. He's going to speak to you in a way that you're going to understand. But I do want to tell you this, God speaks in a myriad of ways, but he does have a preference. It is his preferred, his preferred way of speaking to us is speaking to us in our mind, like conversations, like how we have a conversation. Yeah, him, you have a conversation, except it's going to be in your head, okay? In regards to the language of God and him speaking to you in the way that you understand for effective communication, that also means that occasionally he will use slang. God is incredibly proper speaking. Like he has some excellent speech etiquette, okay? But if it's for the sake of the conversation, for you to understand his message in the best way possible, if he has to use slang, that of course isn't like a curse word or anything, then he will absolutely use slang. But also God will absolutely use pop culture references in order to get the point across to you. And to give you an example, you might be going through some spiritual warfare and God's telling you to put on the armor of God. And he might say this, he might be like, son or daughter, 
you know how Iron Man just can't defend the people that he loves and he can't protect the earth and all those different things whenever he doesn't have on his Iron Man armor? He's like, that's you in the spiritual realm. Whenever you don't put on the armor, God, you're not able to protect yourself. You're not able to go to war properly in prayer whenever you don't have the armor on. So make sure to put on your armor, God, before you go to bed or when you wake up in the morning. In some cases, due to how humans are, that's just the best way for him to get the point across so that we can actually genuinely understand what he's telling us. Also, sometimes when God speaks to you, he's not going to use words. He's going to use an urging or a yearning in your spirit, or he might pop up an image or an idea in your head. Sometimes the ideas that you get aren't from you, they're from God. And I also want to tell you this last thing since we're running out of time, but God does ask questions. It's just all, all his questions are rhetorical. And the point of the question is really is to make you think and to put you in perspective, just like he did with Adam and Eve. But I want to invite you guys to my Bible classes every single Thursday at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern on Google Meets. That's all I got. Make sure to have a blessed day. Know Jesus loves you. I'll see you guys. What's a history fact that just gets you choked up every time? Jesus died on the same place that God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And then when it was all said and done, Abraham named that mountain the Lord will provide. And 4,000 years later, the Lord did provide his son Jesus to die for us. When I tell you that I'm absolutely wrecked by this information, I'm not exaggerating. And now I want to sit back and relax and enjoy my evening. When all of a sudden, I hear this agitating, grating voice. Y'all mad because we serve in looks and Jesus. Come Stay mad, boo. So honestly, the Lord has um, showed me this. Um, I wouldn't even say a revelation because it's clear as day in his word. But understanding this helped me so much on my walk. So y'all know that letter Paul sends in Revelations. And he's talking about how um, a church lost its first love. And how they were being super obedient. They were doing all these good things. But their heart, it was a heart issue. And so for a while, I had this same issue and I was praying to the Lord, Lord, I want to truly love you the way you love me. So allow me to understand your love because I don't want to just be being obedient because I have to. Like I want it to be enjoyable. And he broke this down to me. So when God first introduced himself to us, we knew that he saw us as his children. Many times in the word, we see him saying he's a father to the fatherless and that we are children of the God, the most high. We are sons and daughters. So getting in the word, 2 Corinthians 6.18 says, And I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. And we know fathers to, you know, will have our best interests at heart to know things that we don't know. Like as a child, you won't see, you know, the things or know the things that your parents know. So that's why it's so important to walk in wisdom and to, you know, accept the advice from elders. All right, so we have part one of the relationship that we try to fathom is like a child and a father. Then in Proverbs 18, 24, it gives reference to a friend being closer than a brother, meaning a very, very intimate relationship or friendship rather. And then we see that when God sends Jesus down, he embodies this. So we have Yahweh, who's a father, and we have Jesus, who's our friend. And, you know, I'm family oriented. So, you know, I like spending time with my family. But I know like when I come home from like whether it be traveling, school, basketball, I'm really looking forward to seeing my friends, like Lincoln, my brethren. So like as much as you pray to the Lord as a father, you want to pray to him as a friend. You want to talk to him as a friend, like the same way you be FaceTiming your friends and trying to put them on tea. You got to put them on spiritual tea, like, yo, this is what's going on. You know, like really lock into that relationship and put in that effort. This part is where he blew me. So we know that you always a father to us and we know that Jesus is closer than a brother. But we know that when Jesus comes back, he's looking for what? A bride. So it is here we see that the Lord is the only one capable of giving us fully unconditional love from a fatherly perspective, brother closer than a brother, and a lover. And so he's been depicting this picture of he is looking for people to be faithful to him. That's why we say it's a relationship with God. It's a relationship in many different values and ways, whether it be father, daughter, father, son, friend, relationship. And once you start thinking of it like that, certain things you'll do will start to change. Like, yo, I used to talk God's ear off, but then I thought of like a relationship, like when I want my husband to talk to me 95% of the time and he only gives me five minutes to listen. God wants us to be faithful. He wants all our attention on him. That's why he says our eyes like a lamp and adultery is committed as soon as it happens in the heart. Because once you take your eyes off the cross and you look at other things and sinful things, that is where sin develops. Every time we choose to sin, we are choosing to cheat on God. And I don't know about y'all, but I've gone through some pretty dramatic breakups that make me really, 